Welcome to today's webinar, Spoiler Alert, States Fight Against Food Waste, brought to you by NCSL. It is now my pleasure to turn the floor over to Kristen Heldreth. The floor is yours. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's National Conference of State Legislatures webinar, Spoiler Alert, States Fight Against Food Waste, where we will discuss state efforts to reduce food waste while highlighting landfill bans, waste to energy systems, and efforts to encourage food donations. My name is Kristen Hildreth, Policy Associate for NCSL's Natural Resources and Infrastructure Committee, and I'll be your moderator today. Before I introduce today's speakers, I want to review a few house housekeeping items. Today's webinar is part of the NRI's Spring 2017 webinar series. As part of the series, the committee will host a new webinar every week with our next webinar, Thursday, May 18th, with a focus on the risk to the nation's pipelines network efforts to reduce excavation damage, and examples of state action to update damage prevention laws. For a complete schedule, recording to previous webinars, and registration details, please visit our website at www.ncsl.org. Today's webinar is hosted in partnership with the Hunger Partnership, which was launched in 2010 to raise the visibility of hunger in America and to highlight innovative and lasting solutions around the issue. The partnership's goal is to connect public, private, and nonprofit sectors to improve the availability of healthy food for hungry families. If you are interested in learning more about the Hunger Partnership, please contact the Partnerships Director, Ann Morse. Assisting me today in moderating is Shakina Shabazz, an Emerson Hunger Fellow with the Hunger Partnership. Hi, good to be here with you all. As a reminder, our webinar today is being recorded and registrants will be able to access a recording of the webinar and presentation slides on NCSL's website. We will send out a notice shortly with a link to these resources. Additionally, you can download the slides being used today by clicking in the upper right portion of your screen. I know all of you will have a lot of great questions for our presenters, so we will hold Q&A until after all of our presenters have gone. The Q&A will be held through our chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen. So please feel free to type in your questions at any time during the presentations. I and Sakina, as moderators, will be gathering the questions and will read them out loud to our presenters towards the end. So back to why we are here today. Getting food from the farm to our fork takes a significant amount of energy, land, and water resources. Yet up to 40% of food in the nation goes uneaten. Food waste is the single largest component of municipal landfills where it not only breaks down to produce methane, but also goes unconsumed. The question is, how can the amount of food waste be reduced, and what are the avenues for that reduction? Today we are so lucky to have with us Emily M. Broadleaf, Assistant Clinical Professor of Law and Director of the Food Law and Policy Clinic at Harvard Law School, Patrick Surfass, Executive Director of the American Biogas Council, and Marcus Schmidt, Director of Advocacy for Second Harvest Heartland. First up is Emily Broadleaf, Assistant Clinical Professor of Law and Director of the Food Law and Policy Clinic at Harvard Law School. Emily is the founding director of the Food Law and Policy Clinic, the first law school clinic in the nation devoted to providing legal and policy solutions to nonprofit and government clients in order to address the health, economic, and environmental challenges facing our food system. She teaches courses on the topic and focuses her scholarship and practice on finding solutions to today's biggest food system issues, aiming to increase access to healthy foods, eliminate food waste, and reduce barriers to market entry for small-scale and sustainable food producers. She has published scholarly articles in the Wisconsin Law Review, the Harvard Law and Policy Review, and the Journal of Food Law and Policy, among others. Emily received her BA from Columbia University and her JD from Harvard Law School. Emily, with that, I pass the floor to you. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for having me join today to talk about um, a topic that is <clears throat> one of several things that we work on here in the Food Law and Policy Clinic, but I will say over the past few years has become um, probably our biggest area of work just because there's so much opportunity and so much interest. Um, so just to tell briefly what our clinic does, um, we are a applied legal um, education program at Harvard Law School. So we serve clients. We have you know clients that are nonprofit organizations, coalitions, government agencies, um, 
at all levels of government. And then we are training students. So all of the projects we work on have law students working to do research, to better explain the laws and help people understand them, or to recommend um, legal and policy changes that could, that could improve the um, food system. And these are the four areas we work in. And of course, today I'll be talking about our work in reducing food waste. Um, so you heard a little bit already about just the scale and the magnitude of the amount of food wasted in the U.S. And just to show that a little bit in detail, uh, there's about you know 40 percent. So you know really nearly half of the food we produce in this country uh, winds up in a landfill instead of making it to the plates and, and into people's homes, or if it, it does make it into people's homes, um, into their trash bins. And this is a huge impact on natural resources. So just as one example about 21% of the water used in the U.S. goes to water crops that we then throw away. And so as you can tell, there's a lot of opportunity here if we can be more efficient and find ways to reduce the amount of food that gets thrown out. And so here's some other statistics. As you heard already, food waste is one of the biggest components of landfills. And while there, in addition to taking up landfill space, it also emits a lot of methane. And so there's environmental impacts on both sides of this topic. So addressing food waste also has sort of a triple bottom line opportunity, and it's one of those like mythical triple bottom line solutions, which is why it's so great. Um, in terms of people, um, if we were able to find that food earlier in the chain and target it and make sure it gets donated, redistributing just 30% of our surplus food could provide food for all the food insecure Americans in the country. Um, in terms of planet, you saw already some of the impact on natural resources and the environment. Uh, reducing food waste could conserve 1.6 trillion gallons of fresh water and avoid nearly 18 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions. And then I'd like to point out there's also a profit piece of this because um, when we actually treat that food as a resource and make pathways to donate it or to uh, compost or turn it into um, energy through anaerobic digestion, there's a lot of economic potential there. So um, studies have shown that, that on a national scale, some of these changes could create 15,000 new jobs and provide $10 billion in annual societal economic value. Another way of looking at that is that we spend $218 billion each year growing, transporting, and then disposing of food um, that goes to the landfill. So there's a lot of economic opportunity. And in Massachusetts, which, which passed a ban on organic waste going to the landfill, they found that in two years of implementing this ban, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a few moments, um, that they saw the creation of 500 new jobs in the state and 175 million in new economic activity. Um, so that's really, you know, this isn't just theoretical. There are actual impacts in, in terms of jobs and economics. At the national level, just to say briefly, we actually have a national food waste reduction goal. It was announced in September 2015 by the USDA and EPA. It's a goal of reducing our food waste 50% um, reduction by 2030. Um, I will say we've been working a lot on this. I think there's yet to be a lot of plans fleshing out how we're going to reach this goal. Um, but I think there's opportunity because we've at least acknowledged that there's a problem and there's some commitment behind it. And also to flag one other resource, we yesterday released a new report called Opportunities to Reduce Food Waste in the 2018 Farm Bill. And so again, this is mostly focused at the federal level, but you can see, um, you know, the link is on there. You can see a little bit what we're recommending. I think the biggest takeaway here is that in the Farm Bill, which is passed every five years and has um, about $500 billion worth of spending over the five-year cycle, not a dollar of that money till now has been spent to make sure that that food actually gets to the plates of people. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity for change there. Um, so what are states doing? We um, launched a new website, um, which is linked here, uh, refed.com slash policy. And this was with a group called Refed, which is a collaboration of businesses, investors, nonprofits, um, academia, kind of working together to analyze solutions to um, reduce the amount of food that's wasted and really look at the cost effectiveness of these. So they had written that report last year, and we had a bunch of reports that had 50 state charts of laws uh, on things like state laws on heat labeling, on feeding food scraps to animals, et cetera. And we partnered with them to create a new page on their website that has interactive maps. So I'm going to today walk through a couple of these key areas. 
I'm going to show you static images, but if you go to that site, you can actually click on your state. Uh, you can go once you click on your state, you can see the state laws on a bunch of these areas. You can also map by map click on an area and see how your state matches up to other ones. And uh, we we really hope this is a way to kind of put this material out there in an interactive way, answer people's questions, and give inspiration as to what are new directions and new opportunities. And just these are the policies I'm going to talk mostly about today. Um, again, briefly, and I know some of the other presenters will talk about some of these topics in more detail. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about date label reform, which is something we've worked on for many years. Um, on the recovery side, sort of donating food, we'll talk a little bit about, um, sorry, I should say liability protections and tax incentives. And then on recycling, um, organic waste bans and waste recycling. And I think it's also really important to flag the image here, which is of what's called the EPA food recovery hierarchy. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because as we're looking for policy solutions or any solutions that reduce the amount of food that goes to waste, it's important to remember that there are better uses of that food. Um, so obviously landfills all the way at the bottom, but um, the, be the best in terms of environmental impact and um, economic impact is really reducing the amount of that food that's produced or you know, not bringing it to a place where it's then not going to be able to be used. The next would be getting it to people who are in need. Um, once we you know, put all of that energy and water and fertilizer, et cetera, to grow and package, et cetera, that food, the best thing we can do if we're not going to um, sell it is to get it um, to somebody who's in need and so on. So, um, so then to go through those policies in a little more detail, um, just to show a little image of, of the, the date labels on packages. So these are the sell by, best before, best if used by, used by. Um, in a study that Walmart did last year, they found that there were 47 different labels in use on their products. Um, so just the brief version of this is actually that these dates are really not uh, related to safety. They're not regulated at the federal level at all. And in fact, the FDA has said that they don't regulate them because they're not safety related. And so they don't see you know, why it's something that they should prioritize. Because of that, many states have jumped in and regulated. And you know, again, this map is a static image. But you can see a little bit here um, just the mismatch of what states do. Um, in some of our reports, we also have it broken down with images on each state of what food products because these not only vary by state in terms of what labeling is required, they also vary between food products within states, and then also some states ban the sale or donation of food after those dates. So the states in the gray color you can see are ones that have no regulations on um, date labels at all. And, in, and New York is a great example. And in fact, New York City used to require a date label on milk. And in 2010, they got rid of that because they realized that it really was not linked with safety. Uh, so a lot of our work on this has been trying to get the message out, trying to help people understand um, why these labels are really confusing to people and what we can do. And I think the best, the best opportunity here would be for states to really uh, eliminate any restrictions on past date sale or donation of foods, um, especially the 99% the of foods where there's really not a safety risk on those, and in many states foods being thrown away because of those. Um, and then also to um, try to clarify between foods having one label if there's a, a quality reason for it and a different label for a safety reason. And this is something that was promoted recently by the Grocery Manufacturers Association and Food Marketing Institute. They are promoting a national voluntary standard of the words best if used by um, for foods that have, a, that have the language for a quality purpose and used by for foods that have it for a safety purpose. Um, so just to give a sense of states that are working on this right now, these are just a few states that have introduced legislation this year that aim to standardize the date labels between foods in the way that I just mentioned. There's also been federal legislation introduced last year that is going to be reintroduced later this spring. And just to give a sense, in Massachusetts, this proposed legislation would um, require the language expires on for food products with a safety risk. Um, and best if used by food products that are just labeling for a quality reason, and would also um, eliminate any restrictions or bans on the sale or donation of food past the quality date. And many of these states have things that are somewhat similar to that. Um, and these, again, are just the states we've been actively working in. Um, there's, there might be others out there, but for each of the, the topics, I'll just give you a quick snapshot. 
The next topic, very briefly, is tax incentives, and I think we'll hear a little more about this later. So as you can see here, there are um, 10 states, if you include D.C., that offer a state-level tax incentive for food donations. Um, many of these states were created specifically to target donations from farmers, uh, and there is also a federal-level enhanced tax deduction that can be claimed for food donations, uh, which is fantastic. It's, it was recently expanded so that now all businesses are covered. But for a variety of reasons, it's challenging for businesses that operate with a very low profit margin to claim that deduction. So farms often op operate with a very low profit margin. It's very challenging. So um, states have stepped in and said, we'll offer a special state um, incentive to really help get this fresh, healthy produce into the hands of people in need and incentivize donation. And here are just a handful of states that have introduced tax incentives this year. I have New York bolded. There's actually passed, uh, I forget if it was last week or the week before, so there's actually now it's passed into law. And what their tax incentive does is it provides a tax credit equal to 25% of the wholesale value um, for donations from farmers to food banks or emergency food programs, and it's capped at $5,000 annually. Relatedly, uh, one of the top reasons more than 50% of businesses say that they fail to donate is because they are fearful that they will have some sort of increased liability risk, um, which I think is really um, unfounded because there's quite strong liability protection at the federal level for food donations, and all 50 states have some amount of liability protection. Most states really mirror the federal one, but as you can see here, the states that are highlighted offer some additional protections beyond what's offered at the federal level. Um, so one example of that might be um, about 14 states allow liability protection for the food donated, even if the food is then sold at a very low price to the end recipients. Um, so this is a way that they're, you know, in addition to food banks and food pantries, there could be opportunities for secondary resellers, things like that, that are, as long as they're nonprofit. Um, so then to look at a couple states, uh, here's a few states that have introduced protections. Um, so California is a good example. It does what I, you know, the, the proposed bill does what I just said about um, allowing the, the liability protection even if the food is sold at a low price. It also clarifies that food past the date is protected and, um, and does a couple other things. And it just passed out of committee, I think, in the House side unanimously. Um, and again, all of these things, I know this is a very brief breeze through. They are all in this interactive map. Um, and then there's another resource I'll mention in a minute that you can get more. Uh, so the last area I'll flag very quickly is organic waste bans or waste diversion mandates. And as you can see, there's only a few states have these at the state level. Um, I just heard today, actually, Minnesota has a version of this as well, and so they're not flagged on there, but they do have something like this. Um, so this is what I mentioned for Massachusetts briefly earlier. In Massachusetts, the way this operates is that commercial um, food businesses are not allowed to send more than one ton of food material to the landfill per week. So it's really for the biggest businesses, uh, but it's really interesting in the way that it operates because it allows the businesses to do whatever they want with that food. They could donate it. They can um, you know, do an audit and reduce their ordering. They could compost it either commercially or on site. Whatever they want to do, they just can't send it to a landfill. And I think we're really seeing these become more popular because they keep landfills more clear. Um, there are you know, a lot of environmental benefits, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, economic benefits. Um, but it's really also a transformational way to think about food waste and really say, uh, this is a resource. We're not just going to throw it away. And I know we'll hear a little bit later about some of the infrastructure pieces of that and what can happen with food that is um, you know, not able to be eaten or donated to people. And again, just like in the other areas, there's a few states right now that have uh, waste ban or waste diversion laws introduced. Um, just to highlight New Jersey, which um, would, uh, if passed at the beginning, would not allow more than two tons um, sent to the landfill per week, and then by 2020 would shift to no more than one ton per week. It does have an exemption for businesses that are further than 35 miles from an authorized recycling facility in the way that the bill is drafted. Um, New York's was part of the budget process, and it looks like it didn't move forward, although it could uh, be separate legislation. So just quick update there. 
So just here, I'm not going to go through this, but this is sort of you know snapshot of like all the different state pieces, and just want to flag here this resource, keeping food out of the landfill. This is uh, kind of the long version of everything I said today, and the um, the things that are in that interactive map. And um, so it goes through about eight or nine areas of policy, what states are doing, what they could do, best practices. Um, so kind of if any of these topics jump out at you, you could look there for a little more information. And um, more than a dozen states that we're working with this spring have introduced legislation. So we are also a resource. States um, staffers, legislators, et cetera, are calling us. And it's really fun for me and especially for my students to get to uh, give good ideas, look over legislation, et cetera. So that's it. And here's some contact information. Um, and I'm happy to now turn it back over to moderators. Thank you, Emily. As a reminder to all participants, questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. So if you have any, please enter them into the chat box on the lower left-hand side of your screen. Next up, we have Patrick Surfass, Executive Director of the American Biogas Council, who will discuss the anaerobic digestion and biogas industry and describe the process for converting food waste into renewable energy. Patrick led the Council in 2010 when he helped 22 companies come together to form the only trade association representing the entire biogas industry in the United States. The Council now represents over 200 organizations and has a network of over 11,000 stakeholders in the industry. In addition to the Council, Patrick has over 15 years experience growing other clean energy industries like solar, hydrogen, and fuel cells through the company that manages the Council, the Technology Transition Corporation. In Patrick's early career, he was a physical oceanographer, architectural engineer, and designed deep, unmanned deep ocean vehicles. Patrick, the floor is now yours. Great, thank you so much. I'm I'm so glad to be here. You know, this is uh, this is maybe the second or the third time that I've spoken with uh, the Harvard Food Law and Policy um, Clinic, and it's so great because they cover the policy um, opportunities and. Um, you know, kind of the tip of the iceberg for what the most progressive states are doing out there to help with food waste and food waste recycling. And I really hope that that those of you who are listening can can take some of these ideas because I think there are a lot of different industries that can that can benefit the benefit if some of these policy ideas are are put into place. So um, I'm going to focus on um, on the recycling part of this. And basically, um, what we're starting to, to call turning food back into food uh, and energy. So just a, a real little bit about the American Biogas Council. We are the trade association for the biogas industry. Um, we represent a lot of companies, and our mission is to build new biogas systems. And you can think of biogas systems as organic recycling systems. So when you have organic material, there are two ways that you can recycle it. You can either compost it or you can digest it. And actually, when you go with digestion, you can even still compost the solids that come out of it on, on the back end. So composting and digestion even can work together. But if you, want, if you have organic material like food waste and you want to recycle it, you've got two options, composting and digestion. Um, and we want to see more digesters uh, built in the U.S. So um, Emily showed this a little bit earlier. She showed the hierarchy on the left here, which is the food recovery hierarchy, and she showed kind of like the top, the top level elements here, which is obviously a little bit easier, easier to read. And um, I wanted to show you this and the solid waste hierarchy because this is really important for state policy. Um, obviously, for food waste, we're focused on the food recovery hierarchy, and the ABC really strongly supports EPA's hierarchy. And we encourage you in any policy that you're developing to reference it because it's, a, it's, it's the way, I think, that we should be choosing what we do with food waste. And so we support making sure that you reduce food waste in the first place. If, if you can't reduce it and you have food waste, try feeding people and animals. But then after that, that's where we come in. We want to make sure that any food scraps that can't go to people or animals and exist in the first place, and that's always going to be there unless we start finding creative ways to eat onion peels or banana peels and pineapple tops, you know, there's always going to be food waste. And we need to have an infrastructure to be able to recycle uh, those materials. And we'd like that to happen in biogas systems. So you can see in the food waste hierarchy, um, digestion and composting are here above landfilling and incineration. So from our perspective, we really want to be the bottom of the hierarchy. We don't want food waste to go past 
uh, recycling, which is biogas systems and composting. We're not anti-landfill. There's a place for landfills. And in fact, if you can help keep the food waste out of the landfills, then the landfills can last longer. Their business can even last longer um, because they have more space in it. And Because we will probably need landfills to recycle some materials until we get really sophisticated with being able to recycle everything. So they have a place. But for food waste, we should make sure that all of it's recycled. I wanted to point out the solid waste hierarchy with EPA because they're really behind the times on that hierarchy. And if you're doing anything, if you're creating any solid waste plans, um, I encourage you to not reference the EPA's solid waste hierarchy. And the reason is because when you really dive into the levels, they include, they basically don't recognize the recycling value of anaerobic digesters. And it's insane because they recognize it in their own food waste hierarchy, uh, food recovery hierarchy that, that they have as well. They're just, um, they're just very slow in updating this. So many states have done this. They've said, okay, if you have solid waste, obviously first you reduce and re reuse it, and then you recycle it. But make sure you remember that recycling includes anaerobic digestion. It's, not, it's much, much, much better than incineration and landfill on here. So for us, we spend a lot of time trying to get people to care about biogas systems because not a lot of people know what biogas systems are. And so here's what, we, what we've come up with that we think we need to get people to really care about. And hopefully it's something we can all agree with. We need to get the public to care about recycling food waste. How do we do that? Um, hopefully that's where, that's where you come in. Um, we need to get more folks to care about it. And for folks who aren't going to care about it, we need to put some policies in place that help make sure that food waste is recycled. We believe that if we can start there, then people will start asking the questions that we want them to ask, which is, okay, how do you recycle food waste? And what do we need to do to put that infrastructure in place? So um, basically, I'm going to come back to a couple policy recommendations. But right now, for this middle um, part, for a couple minutes, I'd really like to just take a minute to try to help you get more familiar with what a biogas system is. Um, if you've actually seen a biogas system, you're probably in the minority, and that's great. Um, but for those of you who haven't, I hope that this will be enlightening to you so that you can recognize and, and know what a biogas system is. And if you're interested in visiting one, we do have 2,000 systems around the country. Um, I hope you'll, you'll get in touch with me, and, and we'd love to set you up with a visit to a digester. So basically, if you look at the, um, and I think I've got my cursor on here, um, you've got organic material like food waste or animal manure or um, sludge from a waste water treatment facility. That goes into a big tank, and that's your anaerobic digester. Bugs, microbes, just like in a cow's stomach, um, eat up that organic material, and they burp out the methane, which is the biogas. And that can be used for vehicles, electricity. It can go into the pipeline for fuel. The solids and the liquids are really important because they still come out. So we've only pulled out carbon and hydrogen in the gas, and all the nutrients, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your potassium that were in your organic material to start, out, to start with have now come out here, and now they're processed into this kind of super fertilizer, which is like a compost. And that's where turning food waste back into food really comes in, because you've taken food waste, you've digested it and pulled out the energy, but now all those nutrients are there in the soil product. Well, we put that soil product back in the soil, and you're recycling the nutrients. Most of our nutrients are actually imported, we use fossil fuels to make most of our nitrogen fertilizers because you use natural gas to make ammonia um, using air and the nitrogen in the air to make, ammonia fertil to make nitrogen fertilizers. And we import a lot of the phosphorus from overseas. So recycling the nutrients is really important. And in terms of food waste, from a business perspective, this is why we really care about it. So this is a chart that shows how much biogas is made from different materials. You can see manures. Um, are at the bottom. And if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. Manures make less energy because it's food waste that's already been digested once by the people or animals, right? So food waste that is still just food waste, and especially fat soils and greases that have a lot of energy in them, anything with sugars in it like bakery waste and carbohydrates, it has tons and tons of energy in it. So food waste produce 10 to 35 times more biogas than manure. And to someone developing a biogas system, that means it generates more revenue. So not only do we care about the environment, but recycling food waste is a good business proposition because it can produce more biogas, and that means more renewable energy for you. So I'm just going to flip through a couple slides here to give you a visual rep representation of what we're talking about. When we get food waste, it generally looks like this. Sometimes you get something, get a truckload, and you can actually notice moldy loaves of bread and whole watermelons and, 
you know, some things like that. You can see a pineapple top that's, that's right down here. But generally it looks like this kind of really gross smoothie um, that you have to handle. And it's really important to recycle because that material is otherwise sitting in our dumpsters out behind grocery stores and restaurants and hotels. If we can recycle it in a container, it's going to help with vermin problems and odor problems and lots of other things as well. Here's another way to look, that look at food waste. These are, these are some photos I just took the week before last at a digester. This is French onion dip. It comes on a big pallet. There are tons of these little cans. You put it through a machine, and look at how clean the material is that, that comes out. So this is all ready to be recycled. All this metal is ready to be recycled. But all the French onion dip that was in there got pulled out, and that goes into a digester. Here's a uh, cheese dip. And you can see once the cheese dip is taken out by the depackager, and there's the material that's, that's left over. This is probably not recyclable. It probably needs to go to a landfill. The metal on the left probably is recyclable, and that's good because it can have another life. Here's what it looks like in the back of a grocery store. This is a Whole Foods um, up in uh, just north of Boston in Andover. And you can see they've got some spoiled, some spoiled bananas. Generally, they take the um, meat packing and... Uh, and spoiled milk and things like that. And there's basically just a big sink. And underneath that sink is a big garbage disposal that Insyncrator makes and called Grind Energy. It grinds it up and then it shoots it up this pipe right here. And it comes out to this tank, which they've <laughs> um, creatively painted like a cow, even with, uh, with a pink udder where the food waste comes out. So instead of all the food waste and the spoiled milk sitting out in the hot summer in this dumpster where it says Harvey right here, and then sometimes even leaking into the parking lot, there's a parking lot right back here, um, all the food waste gets, um, gets stored in this tank. It gets picked up, taken to a digester on a farm. And for energy, we're generally talking about making electricity um, from a biogas engine, or we take the fuel, we use it to fuel vehicles. Um, this is a refuse truck that actually picks up food waste, and it picks up enough food waste to make biogas to fuel the vehicle for its next run. Some folks are even taking the biogas and making plastics out of it. Dell's, your de next Dell computer might have a plastic bag made from biogas. We reuse the heat that comes off of a biogas system as well, sometimes to dry the material and to heat the digester and lots of other things. And then here's what the solids and liquids that come out when we talked about recycling the nutrients. So you can see it looks everything from like, sort of looks like a peat moss here. Here's a liquid fertilizer that can be sprayed on fields or um, even uh, there's a company that I'll show you in a minute that makes, that puts this into a growler so you can uh, take it home and use it for your plants. They call it brew -do. Here's some of the products. There's the brew bottle right there. Here's Magic Dirt. This is sold in Walmart. This is all 100% renewable, made from food waste and manure that's been turned into biogas, and these are the solids and liquids that are left over to recycle the nutrients. So here's what, here's what a system might look like uh, near you. This is an urban system. Um, waste management's grinding up lots of food waste, and they're delivering it to wastewater treatment facilities in L.A. County, um, New York, and hopefully um, soon in Boston. And then here's one in Oregon that's taking in food waste. This is one of the first food waste systems in the northwest U.S. Um, they're making uh, electricity and selling the fertilizer products there as well. Here's one down in Florida. They're taking all the food waste left over from the Walt Disney Resorts and the hotels and resorts down there, mixing it with the sludge from the water treatment facility that's right next door, making renewable energy and selling a fertilizer that they use to sell to all the folks that are growing the flowers that they use um, at the Walt Disney Resorts and, and food and other ornamental um, decorations that they, that they sell. So here's a, here's a small company that makes the brew This is a micro-digester. So you saw those other companies, those other systems were really large. This is a very small containerized system. They're actually dumping this in the back corner of a parking lot at a brewery. So they've got a restaurant at the brewery. They make, micro, they make a micro-brew there. And they're taking all the spent grains and the food waste left over from the restaurant, and they're recycling it right here in this container, genera generating a small amount of electricity that then goes back to the, back to the restaurant. So now that you've got a little bit of familiar familiarity with uh, biogas systems, here's the map of uh, operational biogas systems. So I really hope that you'll ask to go, um, to go visit one and see how some of your systems nearby might recycle food waste. And you might discover that there's a facility right near where you are um, that could be recycling food waste, or maybe it is recycling food waste. Or maybe you'll discover, actually, we 
don't have one nearby. We really need one. We need to build that infrastructure. So there's a little over 2,000 operational biogas systems, but there's the potential for 14,000 more. Um, we have state profiles on our website under our policy page. So if you um, are interested in knowing what the biogas opportunity looks like in your state, go to the policy section of AmericanBiogasCouncil.com, click on your state, and you'll see your, your state profile right there. So um, these are my, my last two slides here, and these are kind of the, the main takeaways here. So if you're going to develop policies that encourage food waste recycling, we really need that because um, developing a biogas system is not quite as simple as buying a solar panel, bolting it to a roof, and creating an electrical connection. You have to have waste management. You know, you've got material that's coming in. You've got to have something to do with the gas that's coming off. Are you going to sell it as vehicle fuel, put it into the pipeline, sell it as electricity? What are you going to do with your solids and liquids? All of these things in the system need to come together. And here are a few things that can help increase the infrastructure for biogas systems, which gives you a place to be able to take your food waste to recycle it. So the first is what Emily already mentioned, which is organics recycling requirements. And our recommendation is you start with the largest commercial food waste generators. That way you are um, imposing a requirement on fewer entities, but you're also covering most of the food waste. So the most food waste in most jurisdictions, most states, comes from the commercial food waste generators. So, um, and most of the industrial food waste generators are probably already covered. So we suggest starting there. Um, if you can make permitting and interconnection easier, that'll take less. It'll take less time to develop projects, and that'll mean that the project development costs will come down. Buy the digested, buy the soil products that come from your area biogas systems, or create an incentive for folks to use digested, to use recycled nutrients instead of synthetic fertilizers. That'll help to get projects financed. Um, create long-term contracts um, with the waste generators, or encourage the waste generators instead of going month to month, encourage them to sign one to five year contracts, especially with someone who will recycle food waste. And if you can do anything to make it more attractive to sell the electricity with a feed-in tariff or encouraging utilities to buy renewable natural gas, like through an RPS uh, or some part of the RPS that's related to gas, that would really help as well. So if we can all do this, if we can, you know, do a good job recycling food waste, there's a lot of folks who are going to benefit. The industry is going to benefit. Your constituents are going to benefit. And, you know, we're all going to benefit. So here's some of the top, top benefits from doing this. You're going to get renewable energy, but when you want it. Most folks, most biogas systems are generating renewable energy 24-7, but a few of them are actually storing it so that they wait until the time when everyone comes home and turns on their air conditioners in the summer and their TVs and their lights when that peak power really peaks. Then they dump all the biogas electricity um, onto the grid, and they help with peak shaving so that you don't have to start up um, natural gas plants or um, you have to keep the coal-fired power plants running a lot higher than you, than you need to just to cover those peak needs. You're going to recycle nutrients, and that's not only going to help your agriculture industries, but it's going to keep the nutrients out of the watershed, and that will give you watershed protection. You're going to generally lower your waste management costs. Lots of times this comes from just the fact that once you pay attention to how much food waste is being recycled, you're going to buy less food, you're going to buy smarter, you're going to make smarter decisions. And from a city perspective, you're going to have less waste going to the landfill, and then instead you're going to have some of it going to recycling. So you should be able to overall, even though some costs may go up in some places, you should overall be able to reduce your cost for how you handle waste management. You're going to impact rural areas and urban areas. You're generally going to reduce odors. This is smelly, smelly material. It's going to stink somewhere. Why not put it in a closed tank like a digester where you can control that odor a lot better? You're going to reduce greenhouse gases because otherwise you would be emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere from landfilling the material. And you're going to create jobs and private investment from the new biogas systems um, you can develop. So thank you very much for your attention. I hope that we'll have some questions. And um, I look forward to hearing our next presentation. Thank you, Patrick. Last but certainly not least, we will hear from Marcus Schmidt, Director of Advocacy for Second Harvest Heartland, who will provide information on the Farm to, Farm to Food Shelf Program in Minnesota. Marcus is a Minnesota native, and prior to his work at Second Harvest Heartland, spent nearly a decade as an aide to Congressman Tim Waltz of Minnesota's 1st District. Marcus holds a BA in Political Science and Philosophy from Gustavus Adolphus College and a Master's in Public Policy 
from the University of Minnesota's Humphrey School of Affairs. Marcus lives in St. Paul with his wife, Jennifer, and their one-year-old son, Eli. Marcus, with that, I pass the floor to you. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so as, uh, as she mentioned, uh, Second Harvest Heartland is a food bank. Uh, we are actually one of, if not the largest food bank in the country, depending on uh, how you measure it. So I like to share with uh, our state legislators here in Minnesota that we are the largest. Um, and I was asked to talk about the Farm to Food Shelf program, which has been uh, a pretty successful uh, example of kind of public policy and the intersection of uh, different uh, interest groups coming together uh, in order to address, um, uh, you know, a need in, in Minnesota, but also a need, I'm sure, uh, elsewhere. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our organization, just give you an overview here. Um, our mission is to end hunger uh, with an emphasis on forming community partnerships. And this Farm to Food Shelf program, I think, is a really good example uh, of what you can accomplish when uh, you are uh, thinking a little bit outside the box and, um, and building a coalition of organizations uh, that have some clout at, at your state legislature. So we serve 41 counties directly uh, in Minnesota and then 18 in western Wisconsin. We have an arrangement with uh, the Feeding America Food Bank uh, over there to serve uh, that area of Wisconsin because logistically it's easier for us to do that out of Minneapolis and St. Paul. We provide 75% uh, of the food uh, that's distributed to uh, not quite a thousand partners. So those are food shelves, charities, uh, other organizations and communities across uh, Minnesota. And we actually, we serve all 59 counties, or excuse me, all 87 counties in Minnesota uh, because we work with the other five Feed America food banks that are, are much smaller than we are. So here are the folks we serve. Uh, just kind of a quick snapshot. Last year uh, we served uh, about 530,000 people uh, I expect that number to be over 600,000 uh, this year. Um, most of them are seniors uh, or kids or families uh, in which at least one of, um, one of the parents uh, is working. So that's just a quick snapshot of who we serve. Uh, last year we distributed over 80 million meals, and 55% of those meals uh, were fresh, uh, fresh food. And that growth is attributed to our Farm to Food Shelf program, which I'm going to talk about now. Uh, in the context of uh, fighting food waste, uh, this program was launched a couple of years ago uh, as a result of uh, our efforts as well as the efforts of some uh, egg, egg organizations, agriculture organizations in Minnesota, the Minnesota Farm Bureau, uh, which tends to be a little bit more conservative, uh, and Minnesota Farmers Union, which tends to be uh, the more progressive agriculture organization, as well as our Department of Agriculture. So uh, they all got together um, with a couple of key legislators and uh, explored this concept, uh, lined everybody up, um, and they were able to garner uh, bipartisan support both in the Senate as well as the House. The House bill at the time had every member of the Agriculture Committee sign on because they were excited about the opportunity uh, to invest in this program, um, which essentially takes uh, commodities, so fruits, vegetables uh, that are grown in Minnesota uh, that otherwise wouldn't be harvested. So for whatever reason, um, farmers aren't able to, to harvest this product. They don't view it as uh, cost beneficial uh, to harvest the product. There might be an excess in the marketplace, or they're just uh, they're not able to to do that. And what we do is we reach out to these people, uh, these farmers, and engage them in conversations about uh, opportunities to do something with that, with that commodity. And rather than just letting it go to waste, uh, we reimburse them uh, through a grant that we, are, that we Second Harvest Harlem, received from the state of Minnesota um, to reimburse them for the cost of, um, of harvesting and transporting uh, those goods. So uh, it's, it's definitely been uh, a successful program thus far. Uh, we received $2 million in the initial appropriation uh, to apply towards this program. And looking over the past three years uh, since that was implemented, uh, <clears throat> we've uh, garnered several million pounds. At the time, we were expecting about 14 uh, 0.6 million pounds, and there's a list of some of the, the types of produce that we're able to grow in Minnesota that we're able to, to uh, utilize for this program. So here's a snapshot of 
uh, where we get our produce. So that 55% of the food that we're trying to get into um, the stream here uh, as a result of some of our different programs. And our retail food rescue is also a program there in blue uh, that I'm happy to talk about with folks on the call uh, who are interested. But the, for the purposes of this conversation, I wanted to talk about the Farm to Food Shelf program. And you see uh, on the left side in red, uh, egg surplus. So there's 11 million pounds. Uh, just in 2016, uh, we were able to get 11 million pounds of produce and 6.3 million of those pounds were the result of the Farm to Food Shelf program. So that's produce grown by uh, Minnesota farmers that is distributed to Minnesota's food shelf. There's no way that we would have been able to uh, to uh, source this much produce uh, without this program. So it really has been uh, a win-win. In terms of the outreach, we're uh, actively seeking new participants for this program all the time. Uh, one of my colleagues spends most of her time uh, responding to the needs of uh, our, our farming partners. Uh, and this list has grown, I think, from 53 uh, a year ago to uh, 87. Uh, produce farmers that are participating all across the state. And so that process uh, essentially is um, outreach from us to them uh, and just explaining to them the, the benefits of the program as well as um, explaining how they go about getting that reimbursement. So it's, uh, it's definitely been um, a, a program that has required quite a bit of engagement from us. Um, but also uh, is uh, something that we're continuing to actively seek new participants in. So we just view this as a win-win across the board in terms of public policy. Uh, as a food bank, we're, we're very concerned uh, with the nutrition and health uh, of the folks that uh, our client base uh, who are food insecure. In Minnesota, that's one in 10 Minnesotans, one in six kids, unfortunately. Um, and this also speaks to sort of the crux of this conversation today, which is uh, reducing food waste. So this is food that, that otherwise would, would be wasted, and what we're able to do then is uh, get that into uh, the food system so that it's utilized. And for farmers, uh, this is uh, a benefit to their bottom line as well. So it's kind of a win across the board in terms of uh, public policy, which is, you know, why we have been successful uh, this year with our request to renew this program at $1.1 million for the next two fiscal years. Um, we had a transition of power at our legislature this uh, last election. Uh, so we had some chief authors on our regional legislation uh, who were of one party, and uh, the state legislature in Minnesota uh, had about a third of its members uh, who were new. And through education and uh, some support from our Department of Agriculture, uh, who also view this as a, a positive program, we were able to just essentially uh, continue to, to move along with some new uh, chief authors uh, and went through the same process where we engaged uh, those third-party organizations uh, to make sure that, um, that our legislators understood how the program worked and that we were able to um, get through the process. So uh, our, ag our uh, state legislature is uh, wrapping up um, in the next couple of weeks here, and we're just essentially waiting for the governor to sign uh, the Ag Finance Bill so that we're able to continue this program. So that uh, is uh, our, our Farm to Food Shelf program uh, in a nutshell. Happy to take questions along with uh, the other panelists and just appreciate the opportunity to participate today. Thank you, Marcus. As a reminder, um, if you have any questions, please type them in the lower left-hand box. Um, we have a few that have been submitted. Um, Emily, as understood, the food clinics had a role in guiding implementation of the organic waste ban in Massachusetts. Can you describe that process and your interactions with the legislature? Sure. Uh, good question. Uh, so actually, interestingly, in Massachusetts, I think it's the only state that's done this, the food waste um, organic ban was actually done by regulation, not by legislation, which um, I think has some pros and cons to it. I think in terms of the pros, it meant that the agency that did this, which was the Mass Department of Environmental Protection, um, kind of had a lot of flexibility. They actually, I think, to on... For all, to all accounts, did a really nice job of 
engaging um, businesses, um, you know, f composting and anaerobic digestion facilities, haulers. Um, so they did a really good job of getting a lot of input and rolling it out in a way that made sense. I think one of the downsides is that there's not a lot of knowledge about it from, you know, and, and sort of support from other agencies because there wasn't really a statement on the part of the legislature. Um, so that's just one thing to flag. And then we've worked very closely with the agency uh, and in particular the Mass Department of Environmental Protection has uh, funds a group called Recycling Works in Massachusetts that does a really amazing job of, of hands-on technical assistance around this, around several of the landfill bans, but in this one in particular. And they've put out guidance and training on, on composting, um, and we worked closely with them to do guidance related to donation. So we put out some fact sheets that they've disseminated on the laws, similar to the ones I talked about, just what are the laws in the state around donating food. Um, and we also work with them and with the Department of Public Health to put together guidance, safety guidance for donating food, so like the best practices for um, food safety. We've done handouts like that now in about five or six other states, including Tennessee, North Carolina, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut. I think those are the main ones. So, and in all of those cases, it's been working with state agencies that either have an organic ban or are just trying to do a better job of reducing the amount of food in their landfills. Great. Um, moving forward, if you have a legislator that approaches you and wants to kind of implement a food waste ban um, or kind of a le reduce the amount of food waste within their state, how would you suggest they go about it? Do you want me to take that, or um, Patrick, if you want to, if you have thoughts? Sure. I, I think I think we've seen this done in a couple of different ways. Some states have just gone ahead and put an organics recycling um, policy in place because they know that it needs to be recycled, and they know that putting a policy in place will help get the infrastructure built. Basically, the way these policies work are if you build it, they will come. So the policies are structured like um, if you are a large food waste generator and if there's an operational organics recycling facility within, say, 40 miles, then you have to recycle your material. But if you don't have an operational recycling facility nearby, then you don't have to recycle. And putting those policies in place, then that's what encourages the developers to, to develop the infrastructure to do that. So some states have just gone ahead and developed the policy. Some states, and this is kind of what's happening in, in Maryland, for example, um, is, and it happened in New York City as, as well, is you want to start with a waste characterization study to know exactly how much of different kinds of waste you have to deal with. How much food waste do you have and how does that compare to your traditional recyclables? So if you can start there and, and find out where your food waste is coming from, sometimes it can help you to um, have a more kind of a, a more rifle approach or more custom approach to your particular state or a particular city um, on how to recycle food waste there. Thanks. And I guess following up on that question, um, what sorts of communication and action between stakeholders would amplify and resolve the issue of food waste? And then which stakeholders usually tend to initiate these conversations? I can tell you from, well, this is Patrick. From my perspective, the communication is really key between the people who are going to be impacted, the waste generators, uh, and People in other area, people in other states that have already uh, gone through implementing a policy. There's a, there can be a lot of fear of the unknown, where you know, let's say restaurants um, are concerned. Well, gosh, are my costs going to go up? And what we find in practice is that they they usually don't. They actually go down usually, but we need restaurant owners in a state that might have a policy coming in place to be able to hear from restaurant owners in states that do have a policy in place so they can understand how how such a policy would really impact them. So that kind of communication of how this will actually work and who it will impact. And yeah, the policy won't initially go after the mom and pop shops. It's going to go after the bigger folks who really can have an economic impact, both because they can save money at their restaurant or hotel or hospital or whatever the commercial waste generator is. So that kind of communication is, is really key um, early on. And then also just talking about the 
the benefits that, that can be offered because it's not just about recycling for the good of the earth. There's some good economic benefits there, but they have to be discussed. They have to be discussed. Can I hey, also add on that, sorry, just um, beyond the kind of organic STEM landscape, that one thing that's been really interesting is just the kind of breadth of different consumers and, and stakeholder groups that have been involved and also other agencies. Um, so I mentioned here we, we were able to get the Department of Health involved, and I know in a lot of states and at the municipal level, Departments of Health are getting involved and trying to help people think through the, the uh, donation side and, and any safety concerns. Really more than that, just putting, you know, helping kind of um, get rid of misconceptions around the safety of donating and, and help it be possible. One of the best practices we've seen is actually health inspectors having handouts that they actually go around when they inspect businesses with a handout about here's what you can do with excess food. We want you to donate it. Here's how. Here's the protections that we have. So we've seen that in some counties in like California and um, in the West Coast. Also New York City had at one point a packet that they were giving out um, through inspection. So what's interesting about this work I really think is that there's um, there's so much opportunity. There's so many, so many of the reasons we waste food is just because it's not on anyone's radar. And I think once you start talking about it, there are a lot of like unlikely different agencies that will get involved and and, and I think stakeholders like businesses actually often are trying to figure out what to do with their excess food. Great, thank you. And we have a question in the chat box from Representative Eisenhart. Um, he's curious on who is taking the lead in helping solid waste agencies take the lead on food waste prevention and diversion? Well, this is Patrick. I can, I can tackle what I'm seeing here. And it, it starts with what we're seeing here in D.C. And that is that generally when you look at your garbage, it's about a third traditional recyclables. So that's your glass, metal, paper, and plastics. That's one third. Then you have a third that's usually organics. So that includes yard waste and food waste. And you have a third that's other. And so from a solid waste agency perspective, generally there's some kind of interest or hopefully it's high level interest in increasing recycling rates. So if you ever want to get beyond 30% or beyond 25%, you have to uh, have uh, organics recycling. And when you start talking about organics recycling, that's also when you start talking about, okay, well, how do we reduce food waste generation to begin with? And how do we make sure that we're maximizing food donations and things like that? So generally it comes from some interest right in the agency because they believe, well, gosh, we need to be recycling more. It could also come from an economic um, incentive because when someone actually looks at the cost of hauling all the solid waste, all the, the municipal cost of solid waste, usually a lot of cities aren't handling their municipal solid waste locally. They're generally sending it someplace because a lot of those facilities aren't, aren't nearby. And in an urban area, there's a lot of people, and so there's probably a lot of trash. And so when you just look at that cost and, and say, well, gosh, how are we handling our material now? Could we be recycling a little bit more? If we recycled organics, could that have a positive impact on our municipality, on the state? And usually it's a very obvious yes. And so then it just becomes a question of how. So it really just takes someone wanting to increase recycling rates or wanting to try to reduce their overall solid waste um, disposal costs or management costs. And this is Marcus. I'll just add uh, something to the last two questions because I think it's related. So I alluded to this retail food rescue program that we're running at Second Harvest Heartland. And our strategy there uh, is to engage with uh, retail partners, so Walmart, Target, some of our larger grocery stores uh, in our seven-county uh, metropolitan area uh, to uh, divert uh, products that are their shelf life uh, is running out. And what we've been able to do um, is uh, arrange uh, – daily or um, just kind of frequent pickups with these retail food uh, partners of ours to uh, prevent that food from going into uh, the waste stream and making sure that it gets onto food shelves uh, in, in the same county in which we're uh, sourcing it from. And we've had uh, a lot of success with one county um, as a pilot over the last couple of years, and we're trying to scale that program up at the county level so that we can demonstrate to our state legislature um, that there is uh, something worth investing in um, to keep some of uh, – using state dollars to invest to keep 
um, some of that food from our retail partners that otherwise would go into uh, the waste stream uh, and using it um, in, in more of a, an effective way. So that's something that we're doing is using that sort of small county-based pilot project to demonstrate success with our legislature so that um, they're willing to make a larger investment in more of a, um, a statewide or a, a kind of a county um, regional area. Great. Thanks, Marcus. Um, just letting everyone know it is test two, so we have to have Emily drop off. Emily, thank you so much um, for joining us on the webinar today. Um, we're going to take a few more questions, uh, so if you can stay on, that would be great. Um, so we have one more question from Representative Eisenhart, who notes, what is the incentive to diverse food waste as landfills lose money when waste volumes decline? That's a really... Yeah, that's, thank you. That's a really good question. So, yeah, landfills make money when trucks come in their gate. The trucks get weighed, and they, um, they have to pay a tipping fee to dump their waste. So there's kind of two ways, I think, to look at this. And then it gets a lot, there are other ways, too, that get more complicated. But the, the two most obvious things are, well, let the trucks bring organic waste into the landfill and put a digester on site. Um, there, if you look at um, what the folks are doing on Long Island, uh, I've got folks who have been um, handling solid waste for a long time, like the Vigliotti family, and you know they've got. Um, they look at the fact that you know, look, we can we can still make a lot of money if we take in that organic material. We just need to do something different than dump it in a pile. So put a digester on the landfill. That's that's one option. Um, the other is if the landfill is municipally owned, then I suggest kind of taking this kind of goes back to what I said earlier. Is take a broader look at the solid waste management costs for the municipality, and look at if there isn't a way, even though some revenues can be would be diverted from landfills, if there's an opportunity to save other costs um, by selling the energy that comes from it, um, selling the fertilizer products, and and things like that. Um, there's there are a lot of opportunities a lot of opportunities there that don't have to totally revolve around landfills. When you look at a company like Waste Management, who's actually on our board, um, you know they're making products to be able to handle um, organics because they know that there's money to be made in handling organics, and you actually extend the life of the landfills that you do have, um, you know, with a lot of which are, are running out of space. Patrick, thanks so much for that response. Uh, this is Sakina speaking on behalf of the Hunger Partnership here at NCSL. Uh, Marcus, he showed us that there was a really positive relationship um, for the Farm to Food Chef program in Minnesota. I was wondering if you could speak to uh, what made that partnership successful, and can you speak a little bit more to the importance of bipartisanship when developing a program like that, especially through the nonprofit partners and the state legislature? Sure. Uh, well, I think, um, you know, the, the importance of it, I think, is emphasized anytime there's uh, a shift uh, in control of the legislature, which we just experienced. So um, that, I think, in and of itself is, you know, kind of speaks to itself. But I think what, what the success of this program, you know, was really built on was engaging um, with those third-party organizations, so those agriculture organizations, uh, legislators on the appropriate committees, so that were part of the agriculture committees, and then connecting those legislators with people in their districts who are participating in the program or were people who were benefiting from the program or who would benefit from the program. And that's where really, you know, we were able not only to secure bipartisan support because we were connecting some of our more rural legislators, you know, from some of the more kind of you know, conservative uh, areas of our state with um, with legislators uh, in the urban areas, uh, which in, in Minnesota tend to be uh, a little bit more progressive. And so it just really, it really was a win-win-win, um, you know, three years ago in, in that, um, in that kind of initial infancy of the program. And this year with the transition of power uh, at the legislature, uh, we had to go through sort of a similar education process with some new members uh, and connect them with their constituents who had benefited or who were now participating in the program um, and really viewed it, especially those farmers, really viewed it uh, as, um, as a benefit to, to them in terms of being able to, you know, not waste product because there is kind of that culture of not wanting to waste, you know, among our farm community and 
the Minnesota but also uh, wanting to contribute to the greater good. And so those, those voices of the constituents of both the Democrat and the Republicans who are on these committees um, probably were and remain our most effective tool. Great, thank you. And so um, we have a few more questions, but we'll follow up via email. Um, I'd like to go ahead and extend a final thank you to our speakers, and of course, thank you to all of our attendees for participating in today's webinar. The next webinar in the NRI Committee Spring 2017 webinar series will be held on May 18th on protecting pipelines and efforts to reduce excavation damage. You can register for that webinar on ncsl.org at the same page you registered for this webinar. Thank you again for your continued interest and support of NCSL, and have a great day. Thank you. This does conclude today's webinar. We thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect your lines at this time, and have a great day.